Jesus said a hard thing again. He said, lose your life if you want to find it. And if you find your life, you'll lose it. So uh, let's get it all straight. So uh, we explained what he meant by that. It's obviously is it meaning that you have to die to get to heaven. That may be the case. And it certainly was the case, especially in the first century. But um, generally speaking, he's just talking about talking, getting rid of the old life. And there's nothing to hold on to. The vestige of the old life and the barnacles, you know, of the sinful life, they attach themselves to us. And um, boy, we can really be beat up. But I can remember years back uh, there, we were at the old jail and the, uh, there was a, an intake unit there. Uh, it was called the Shoe. And Officer Addison would be there, and I'd faithfully come every week, you know, to visit the guys. They, they're called new courts when they first come into the jail. So I would go up and talk to them. And I came to this uh, cell, and here a guy looked just like this. He was all beat up and bloodied and so forth. And I, I said, uh, are you looking for a new life? Wouldn't you want Jesus to come into your heart and save you from all this misery and so on? And he said... I'm not ready yet. <laughs> so I said, I said, go look in the mirror, <laughs> right? <laughs> not ready yet. This is what the devil does to you. Beat you up, man, spit you out. And if he can, he'll kill you and take you straight down to the pit. But thanks be to God, we found the new life, didn't we? We got the exit uh, and we said, uh, we don't need that anymore. So uh, the old versus the new. And we, uh, we detailed this morning, these various verses that speak about the contrast of the old and the new life. Of course, this is my one-step program. The one-step program, Jim. Here it is. The one step. So, okay, Jim. Jim, i got to come down and preach one, one of those Friday nights with you again. Okay. Yeah, we have a good time down there. Jim's running a uh, Bible study for addicts over on the north, uh, south side, uh, right by the tunnels. Um, so this is what I teach. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things become new. So it's, it's only one step, but boy, it's a major one. And I hope that people really take the step. I'm going to talk to a young couple tomorrow night. And they, uh, I don't know, they, people are so slippery today. Uh, you have them and then you don't have them. You know, <laughs> the devil, what he's doing with people. So... Um, all right, so uh, we don't need to see all these verses again, but you know, Peter also mentioned it. If anybody could speak from experience, he could. You know, there he was, a cursing fisherman, and uh, Jesus comes along and saves his soul. And so later he writes, and he writes. You know, it's so amazing to us because we just kind of bypass this. Peter is, let's uh, put him in the category of ignorant. That's what they labeled Peter and John when they came to the temple after the resurrection and they were preaching. They were ignorant men. And they took note that they had been with Jesus. But does this sound like the words of an ignorant man? He says, for the time past of our life may have sufficed us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. That's a pretty profound statement right there. When we walked in lasciviousness and what else? Lusts and excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. He's speaking of himself. Wherein they think it strange now that you run not with them to the same excess of riot. Speaking evil of you. He must have felt the sting of rejection from some of his old uh, fishermen buddies. He wasn't in there carousing anymore with them. He wasn't reveling with them. Instead, he was preaching the gospel and trying to win them to Christ. So they began speaking evil of him. Uh, then later, well, earlier, in fact, he says in first, uh, first Peter 2, so he says, which in the times past, uh, we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. And he said, uh, we had not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. And uh, what a big difference that makes in the life, the new and cleansed life. So we spoke this morning and stopped here with Matthew. You know, what a, 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 an amazing moment it was there when Jesus passes by. And when he passes by, we better take advantage of it because he may pass by and never come again. Uh, Matthew had to lose his life as a publican. They were um, a wicked generation. They truly were extortioners threatening people, tax collectors that could collect whatever amount they wanted. And then basically, as long as Rome got their cut, Rome didn't care what you did to people. You could fleece them. Zacchaeus certainly understood that. When he got saved, he said, I got to pay back four times. I've stolen from people. So here's Matthew with his opportunity. Jesus comes by, says two words to him. You know, people often say, um, 
you know, where's the Romans road in the Bible? You know, how do you get people saved and so forth? I think the Romans road is a good idea. It's good sound theology, no question about it. But Jesus never used it. So what did he use to win people? Two words, follow me. Try that one. But of course, we know there was an aura. The Holy Spirit was upon him in fullness, by the way. You and I have never known such a thing. I think, you know, the best we can, uh, we, we have this power of the Spirit, but not like Jesus. It was without measure. And uh, Matthew must have felt that. And so he knew that it was worthy to follow him. Worth it all. Gave up the money table, money changing. Immediately gets up and follows Christ. I love this, you know, that and we have people today that are thinking about it, you know. And we call them seekers. Isn't that it's a nice term? Right? Yeah, they're seekers. And so, oh, man, you better seek him while he may be found. This idea that there's no urgency about the matter. Everything's okay. Jesus is cool with me. Nonsense. We better, you better get saved while you can. You might breathe your last breath before you have the opportunity. Matthew seemed to understand it. And so with uh, the urgency of the moment, he rises up from the table and follows Christ <laughs> and never goes back to the money changing table, nor did Peter back to the fishing nets, as a matter of fact. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And that was the end of Peter, the old life gone. He lost his life, but he found uh, so much the better. We think of Mary Magdalene. Uh, no, she was not a harlot, uh, but she was uh, demon possessed. She had seven devils in her. And Jesus, the Bible doesn't even give us the account, but released her. Released her from the captivity of the devil. And uh, life was changed thereafter. Never would be the same. Uh, we can't skip the, uh, the great miracle of the maniac of Gadara. <laughs> I mean, this guy's out of his mind. He's naked. He's up there cutting himself. He's got tattoos and piercings all over. You know, that's, that's what it says. He cut himself. And uh, why did they cut themselves? It was a sacrifice to the devil. It truly was. That was the whole idea. Piercing, that all had to do with slavery. It had to do with belonging to someone. So they would ear pierce you. And uh, you would belong to somebody. Uh, ownership. Um, I belong to Jesus. We sang it tonight. How about you? Right? I don't need to be pierced. I don't need any holes. I've already got one in my head. I don't need any more. Right? Maniac of Gadara. Man, what a change. Uh, miraculous change. There he sat clothed and in his right mind, Mark says. That says it all. He lost his life as a maniac and as a demoniac with a thousand devils in him. And he found a new life in Christ. And certainly, I mentioned Zacchaeus before, I think, right? There he was in the tree, the little guy. I don't know what it is I love about him. Well, if you're short, you're like him, that's for sure. What a story that is. And there he's up there. Nothing would get in his way. He was not easily perturbed. And I would imagine that most of the crowd hated him anyway to begin with. So they locked him out intentionally. He's trying to look over their heads. You know, I know what he's going through. He can't see over the big head. I've sat behind people and I sometimes tap them on the shoulder. Could you re please remove your head? Uh, you can't see. So Zacchaeus go, climbs up the tree and he's got that you know, bird's eye view. And Jesus comes right under the tree and knows him by name. I'm coming to your house tonight. And what a change what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Then we think of Nicodemus. Well, he was a secret disciple, you know, and he, uh, he didn't want the others to know because they'd push him right out of his elite club. You know, he couldn't, be, he couldn't be a Mason anymore, I guess, right? Or a Sanhedrin or any of the other clubs. When you become a Christian, you don't need any clubs. You've got the greatest club of all, the Fellowship of the Saints. So, uh, but... Some of you belong to the Odd Fellows Club. Nicodemus, well, Nicodemus, Sanhedrin, he said, I've had enough of this. They condemned Jesus to death at my protest. I'll stand up for Jesus now. I'll go show everybody that I'm a Christian. We're going to bury the body, the sacred body of the Lamb of God. He and Joseph came out of hiding. What is this? Stephen. Now we're talking about a man that actually lost his life. Physically, his life was taken from him, stoned to death because of his love for Christ. Uh, he has one sermon. He's a, he's a young man, and he's full of zeal, and he's not afraid to speak up for Christ. And so they take the stones and stone him to death. And, of course, the beatific vision, the heavens open. He doesn't feel a single stone, does he? And, uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. He said, Lord, I see you. Lay not this sin to their charge. They don't know what they're doing. 
And so he mimics our Lord in that kind of divine forgiveness. He lost his life physically, but he found it. One second after he breathes his last, he's in the presence of the Almighty. Uh, we can say the same for the Apostle Paul, couldn't we? You know, he gives his uh, biography, so to speak, that third chapter. It's all about the power of his resurrection. So he says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For which, he says, I've lost all things and count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him. And of course, he continues on, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not that I had already attained. We're already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. My brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I mean, what a biography that one is, right? Chapter 3 of Philippians. Take a look at it sometime. So as I said, Jesus doesn't mean by this losing your life that you have to physically give it up, though we may be called to do that. Now that's something very distant from us in this free land that we live in. That we can gather like this. Thank God for this freedom. There are those that want to take it away from us. We understand that. But uh, we're the church of Jesus Christ and the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. And so far, what an opportunity. I fear that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we'll have to give an account for what we did with this freedom of ours. This is a freedom that they long for in communist China. There they hide secretly, whisper prayers. Uh, there's nobody there that has to encourage people to take the hymn book and sing out. They have to go downstairs in the basement and then they can sing and hope that nobody hears them singing Christian songs because they'll be hauled off to some prison and never heard of again. Same could be said for Russia and the gulags and um, Saudi Arabia and these Arabian countries and so forth and Islam. So, so far, no, we're not called to give up our lives. It is something that you challenge yourself with all the time. What if? What if they had a gun to your head like they did with Rachel Scott? Those demoniacs, those two demoniacs, those teenagers filled with devils who spent their life watching video games and violent television and movies and uh, rock and roll and they got the devil in them and inspired them to go into their uh, school at Columbine and shoot up as many people as they could. And when they found this girl that they knew was a Christian, they said, deny your Christ, deny your Christ. And she wouldn't do it. And they put the gun to her head and shot her. So you never know when we might be called in on the same thing for that matter. So at any rate, some people ask, what happened to all the apostles? Well, most of them ended up in a martyr's death. Now, all I'm giving you here are legends. How true are they? They're not in the Bible, so I can't tell you. Uh, I, know, I know of John's, uh, how John ended up to some degree. Uh, I can posit how Paul ended up because he was faced before Nero. But other than that, all I can go on now is the patristic writings uh, that are traditional writings. And, uh, and I don't deny them because I think uh, these are Christians. They're not going to make up fabrications. That doesn't happen until later when, uh, in the dark ages and then we have the fabrication of the monks and so forth that make up stories. And at any rate, traditionally it says uh, Andrew, he went to the land of the man-eaters in what is now the Soviet Union. Christians there claim him as the first to bring the gospel to their land. He also preached in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey and Greece where he is said to have been crucified. Uh, John, as I said, we know uh, something about what happened with the Apostle John. He's the only Apostle generally thought to have died a natural death from old age. Tradition says they tried to boil him in oil, you know. Uh, and uh, he wouldn't boil. He wouldn't die. So they exiled him to uh, the uh, Alcatraz of that day, Patmos. So he was the church leader in the Ephesus area and said to have taken care of uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, in his home. During Domitian's persecution in the middle 90s, he was ex exiled to the Isle of 
Patmos there, he is credited with writing the last book of the New Testament, the Revelation. An early Latin tradition has him escaping unhurt after being cast into boiling oil in Rome. Uh, so, then we have James, uh, the brother of John. So, you know, father was Zebedee. And he was uh, one of those, uh, one of that elite three, right? Peter, James, and John. James was the first of the 12 to be put to death. Find this in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 12. King Herod had him killed by the sword in Jerusalem. Of course, Simon Peter, uh, the tradition there is that he was crucified around 66 AD in Rome under persecution of ne uh, Emperor Nero. There are all kinds of unverified traditions about his death, most notably that he was crucified upside down because he didn't consider himself worthy to die in the same fashion as Jesus. Then we have Judas. This is Judas, not Iscariot is how he's designated in the Gospels, and he's also called Thaddeus. Uh, tradition holds that he preached the gospel in the area which we now think of as northern Syria, Iraq, and Turkey. He was said to have been killed by, with arrows in Turkey's mountainous northern regions. Uh, Doubting Thomas was probably most active in the east uh, of Syria. Tradition uh, has him preaching as far east as India, where the ancient uh, Marthoma Christians revere him as their founder. They claim that he died there when pierced through with spears by four soldiers. Then we have Philip, possibly had a powerful ministry in Carthage in North Africa, then in Asia Minor, where he converted to the wife of a Roman proconsul. In retaliation, the proconsul had Philip arrested and cruelly put to death. Now Matthew, the writer of our gospel, uh, that we uh, was called Levi, and his name was thus changed, the, cat, the tax collector written uh, the gospel, ministered in Persia and Ethiopia. Some of the oldest reports say that he was not martyred, while others say he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Uh, Bartholomew had uh, widespread missionary travels attributed to him by tradition to India with Thomas back to Ar Armenia and also to uh, Ethiopia and southern Arabia. There are various accounts of how he met his death as a martyr for the gospel. James, the son of Alphaeus, is one of the least three James referred to in the New Testament. There is some confusion as to which is and which, uh, but this James is reckoned to have ministered in Syria. The Jewish historian Josephus reported that he was stoned and then clubbed to death. Simon the Zealot, uh, so the story goes, ministered in Persia and was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. Uh, and then, of course, Judas Iscariot. Uh, death by suicide, the Bible records this. Every one of Jesus' followers died. Uh, uh, ten of them as martyrs. John died of old age, but Judas chose a cursed path. Then there's uh, Matthias, who was the, uh, the one that was chosen to replace the vacancy of Judas. Uh, he was the apostle chosen to replace Judas. Uh, tradition sends him to Syria with Andrew and death by burning. Then finally, Paul, who was martyred in Rome about 66 AD during the persecution under Nero. So there are people that actually had to give up their lives. Uh, and in the first three centuries of Christianity, the age that we call in the book of Revelation, the church in Smyrna, the persecuted church. Um, and during that time, Christians were found and uh, they had the opportunity to save their lives simply by adding a pinch of incense and uh, burning it and offering it to the living Caesar. If they would hail Caesar as Lord, they were off the hook. If they refused to do it and maintained that Christ was their Lord, they were put to death. In some cases, thrown to lions uh, during the Neronian persecutions and uh, many other uh, brutal acts recorded here in Fox's Book of Martyrs. This compendium of the martyrs uh, collected uh, through the folios of the various extant writings, including the ancient patristic writings, uh, and then, of course, uh, the contemporary uh, sufferings that uh, Fox himself could record during the Inquisition. So, a fascinating read. Every Christian should have read it and should read it, and uh, we should reread it, as a matter of fact. In Matthew 5, we remember the Beatitudes. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and speak all manner of evil against you falsely for my 
sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Just a reminder uh, of the blessings come with the martyr's death and the crown that's promised uh, to the martyrs in Smyrna. All right, so let's move on in the text. 26th verse, so what is a man profited, Jesus said, if he should gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? These are rhetorical questions, but they demand an answer. Believers can't just read it and say, well, I don't know, you know, you've got to have an answer to this. And I say it's a rhetorical question because the answer is evident. Believers know what the answer to this is. Uh, what would you give in exchange for the most valuable thing that you have? And that is your soul. So valuable, so very important to us. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? But we think of people that, uh, well, they worship mammon. Things of the world. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is of the world and not of the Father. And the world passeth away, and the fashion thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So, let's remember that what things you may have, do not hold them very tightly. They're material and temporal and quite ephemeral. So, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We think of the rich man, and we noted this morning that uh, he came to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You see, everything has to do with financial gain. <laughs> I want to inherit eternal life. Uh, so it's a, it's a choice of words that we expect from those who are given to the pecuniary matters. We care about finance. Jesus said, well, you know the commandments. And then he recited at least the second part of the Decalogue. Um, and uh, he said, all these I've kept from my youth up. So I guess I have a good way. I'm going to go right to heaven. And he said, well, one thing you lack, he said, sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. You shall have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. And the rich man went away very sorrowful, for he was very rich. It says it all. What did he do? In exchange for his soul, his lucre, his money, his possessions. Now I take umbrage with the scholars that claim that Luke 16 is a discussion, the rich man and Lazarus, uh, that is a parable. Um, no parable has proper names in it. Uh, and actual people, Abraham? No, you won't find that in a parable. Parables are, after all, symbolic. This is an actual account of a man that died, two men that died seemingly the same day. It is ironic, uh, the two eternities that are viewed here. It is shocking. So I'm sure you're familiar with the text in Luke 16. There was a certain rich man, and he was clothed in fine linen and purple, and he fared sumptuously every day. That mean, meant he had a table full of food, right? And there was also a certain beggar whose name was Lazarus. See, again, proper names. Which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed from the crumbs that fell from the master's table. Moreover, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. It's a rather disgusting picture here. What sores were they? He had to be leprous. Uh, and thus he was outside the gate. He was a beggar. All he could hope for were the table scraps that might come from the rich man's table. Oh, but... What a change of uh, circumstance. And what a change of circumstance eternity will bring indeed. That's why you and I must uh, be very careful about making sure that we help the poor. And I'm talking about the genuinely poor. Uh, so we have missions, you know, and these are people that are uh, in very poor circumstances, third world countries and so on. I'm interviewing a uh, missionary to the Middle East he has an outpost in Egypt and in Lebanon. I find this very curious. I want to know more about what he's doing and able to accomplish. Uh, there's probably a death warrant out for him. So uh, he's supposed to come here in March, and I'm uh, anticipating, if all is right doctrinally, that we would have him here and listen to him and then consider him for um, support. At any rate, 
uh, we're in poorer places, and uh, you, you and I, of course, we're in rich America here. Uh, so it's a little different here. Nonetheless, there are circumstances, and we can find people in their penury, and uh, they're all about us. It's not hard to find. And we can do what we can. If we can along the way, we can just help in the name of Jesus. Well, that's the case here. Uh, but the beggar dies. It came to pass that the beggar died and uh, was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. Uh, Jerry Falwell once uh, joked that he was going to put this on his tombstone and the beggar died. I said, well, you know, that's <laughs> every day he'd be on there begging for money. What a terrible witness that is to the world. And for that matter, the church is begging for money. And so do we, don't we trust God to provide the needs? He does so super abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Um, learned that lesson so, so very early. And I'm glad to have held on to it now for 50 years. But uh, this avaricious greed, these uh, ministers of the gospel who are charlatans uh, that are robbing people, Taking widows' checks, boy, wouldn't want to be in their shoes. At any rate, the beggar died and uh, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Well, it went to paradise, was in the center of the earth at that time, but it was a place of, it was paradise. It was beautiful. Uh, they had to wait for Christ to die and rise again, and then they were led captivity captive into heaven itself. But before that, they went to this glorious place. Of, uh, of relaxation, rest, and perfect peace, called Abraham's bosom. But they're very conscious at this point. They're not asleep. There's no soul sleep. They are alive. They're active, and they're enjoying the experience. So what a reverse of fortunes this is. One moment begging for crumbs with dogs licking your leprous sores, and now delivered from your leprosy, and now a table spread before you, so to speak, in eternity. And so the beggar died, and the angels took him to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And he seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, Father Abraham, said Lazarus, uh, have mercy upon me, son Lazarus, that he may dip his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. Now listen, if you're undecided about heaven and hell, this was all I need to see right here. You would not want to go to a place like this. Uh, it's trivialized. People don't speak much about hell. The modern preaching today, they, don't, they think it's a negative and they, you know, you'll chase people away and so forth. Tell them the truth. Amen. You know. Now, now tell it lovingly, tell it with tears, tell it with brokenness of spirit and heart, no question about it, but tell it. Tell the truth. Amen. Tell them what it is. I always remember this circumstance. I preached for years at the Greensburg jail. There was a uh, um, high security jail. They closed it about five years ago. But uh, they had a woman chaplain there. And uh, she was... Uh, she was male-ish, if you know what I mean. And uh, she liked me. And I thought that was strange. You know, when that happens. Like at Kane Hospital, uh, years back, uh, there was a nun that was in charge of activities. And she liked me. And I thought, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she said, you know, she said, when you come, you bring the A-team. I said, what does that mean? She said, well, the other churches, they just send you know, deacons or secondary people. They, the, the ministers are too busy. But you come. I said, well, I'm, <laughs> of course, I, you know, I don't understand it. What's the Bible say? You've got to visit those that are in prison. It's as plain as can be. Visit the sick in the hospital. I have people tell me all the time, well, my minister doesn't come to the hospital. He doesn't? Then let him resign and sell life insurance at any rate. I don't know where, where I'm going with that. Oh, yeah, Reverend D McDormand. And she said, <laughs> she said, when, when you preach about hell, you, you preach it like you don't want anybody to go there. She said, these other guys come in and shout and scream, and they tell all the guys you're going to hell. And she said, when you say it, it's like you don't want them to go there. 
I doubt that she preached about hell, but she let me do it. Thank God. I hope all the time I can win favor with some of these people. Even if we are at uh, polarity, you know, there's such polarity of what we believe. Uh, but uh, had a lot of liberty with her, and she was glad for us to come. At any rate, back to this. So, but Abraham said, son, remember, oh, how terrible that is. Bad enough to be in hell in the torments of flame and fire and, and you're thirsty and you, you just want out of this place and you'll never get out of this place. Now to have, remember, remember the opportunities you had. Remember the gospel you heard. Remember that you in your lifetime, you had all the good things. You had all the provisions. You decided that it was more important to have that and you sold your soul. Lazarus, he had evil things, but now he is comforted, but thou art tormented. Yeah. All right, so the Son of Man shall come in his glory. We're going to the 27th verse now. So for the Son of Man shall come in the, in the glory of his Father and his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, uh, the strangest thing happens here. Uh, chapters and verses were not inspired. They're not part of the Bible. They were placed there, and I'm glad they're there because otherwise we would have just this uh, continued uh, letter, gospel, and so forth without any interruption. It would read as though one long paragraph. So uh, monks decided it's at the, a certain point that it needed to be annotated, it needed to be divided, it needed to be placed in chapters and verses that you could thus refer to. Uh, but sometimes I, I think they pick some strange places to put a chapter division, and this is certainly one of them, um, because it ends this way and leaves you on the edge of the cliff. Some of you will not taste of death until you see the kingdom. Uh, end of chapter, right? I wouldn't want to stop there. You got to go to chapter 17, which we won't get to tonight, by the way. But at any rate. All right, so when you see, when you see the Son of Man coming in the glory of his Father with his angels, glory means Shekinah, Shekinah glory. Shekinah glory, no man can stand before it. It's like standing in front of the sun. The Shekinah glory, uh, uh, no man could, could see it for long and live. It would come down in a, a diluted form when in the Old Testament the sacrifice was made, the blood was shed uh, and sprinkled over the Ark of the Covenant. And the mercy seat was ground zero. It was called two things, the judgment seat and the mercy seat. I tell you this, it will either be a judgment seat or a mercy seat when we get before God. It's either the great white throne judgment or it'll be a mercy seat. Once the blood is applied, it becomes a mercy seat. The judgment was made at the altar and that propitiates an angry God. And God would demonstrate his favor that his wrath was placated and he would come down and visit man with a cloud of glory, Shekinah glory. It was partial. It wasn't the fullness of his glory. No man could withstand that. It would enter into the Kodash called the Holy of Holies. And the high priest would be in there and fall on his face. The uh, tradition was that you would tie a rope to him. No one could go in the Holy of Holies but the, ho but the high priest himself. And he only once a year. So if he should die because of the glory, how would they get the body out? So uh, their fabrication there was to tie a rope to him. And if he died, they could pull his dead body out. Now that was, <laughs> that's how great the glory of God is. And when Jesus comes in 2 Thessalonians 2, he'll destroy the wicked with the brightness of his coming. The glory of God. So there will be no war that's involved here. Uh, you say, well, we're coming back with him. Yes, we are. We see it in Revelation 19, you know, we're, we're clad in uh, white linen, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. 
and we come back with him in glory. And we're coming back to take possession of what is rightfully his, what he has redeemed, and that is the power of the freedom from the curse and the world now has been liberated. And we're coming back as liberators. But I tell you, uh, we won't be wielding swords. We won't need a thing. We're coming back. Jesus will destroy his enemies with the brightness of his coming, the Shekinah glory. Here it's alluded to that he'll come in the glory of his father and his angels. So we're all coming back to take possession of the earth and to doom Antichrist and his kingdom and those that have received his mark. Well, that's all there uh, said. And uh, this, of course, is to give, to some degree, some consolation to the apostles that he's just told, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, be rejected of the scribes and Pharisees, I'm going to be crucified, and the third day I'll rise again from the dead. And they're thinking, no, no, that's not, gonna, that's not what we have envisioned. We have envisioned that we're coming with you. We're going to come into the Jerusalem and they're going to hail you as the king. In fact, we've got the palm leaves ready and we're going to march into Jerusalem. We're going to wave the palm leaves and, and we're going to say, uh, glory to God in the highest. Or, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And, uh, and the gates will open, as Psalm 24 says, right? Lift up your gates, lift up your everlasting doors, let the King of glory come in. And they'll shout, who is the King of glory? They'll say, the Lord of hosts, he's the King of glory. And we'll march in triumph, and we will dethrone Pilate and cast out the Romans, and we will sit in glory in the temple. Jesus said, no, no, that's not going to happen. They're going to take me and crucify me. And, uh, but then I'll rise again the third day. Then I'll come back in glory. And when I come back in glory, I'll come back with a multitude of angels that no man can even number, and with all the saints of all the ages. And then shall he reward every man according to his works. The word reward normally uh, is in a positive context, not here. This is retribution. Reward for the evil that you did. Uh, we look now and wonder, Lord, how long? These people get away with all this evil that they're doing. Lord, how long, how long is this going to go on? We marvel at the mercy of God, the long suffering and patience, but that comes to an end. When the Lord unleashes his wrath and comes down from glory, it's all over for these people that think this is their world. It, they'll all be thrown, dethroned. All the emirates, all the presidents, all the prime ministers, all the politicians, all the people that sit in power, they'll all be cast away. Every king shall bow before the king of all kings. Amen. Amen. I can't hear out of my left ear, so what did you say? Amen. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, uh-oh. Hermeneutics. I know you didn't want this. It's a study of proper biblical interpretation. We need it. We need to understand what's going on today. We're being fooled by doctrinaires, false doctrinaires, uh, individuals that have their own slant on things. Why, there's a proliferation of cults, all of which kind of emanated forth from the last century. And, uh, and now with the internet, anybody that has a, a, a blog, can put out his position of what he thinks and so on. And if there was ever a time that believers needed to have sharpened discernment, it's now. If there was any time or season in the history of the church that the believers needed to be immersed in proper hermeneutics, it is now. So, yeah, that's what happens. See? <laughs> I put everybody to sleep. <laughs> okay, Terry, you're, you're laughing down there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so what's wrong with hermeneutics? Well, you'd say that's for seminarians. Well, I'm not a seminarian, but I study hermeneutics. And these are the principles of, of proper interpretation. Or what the Bible says, rightly dividing the word of truth. I mean, that's a simple way. You've got a big word, hermeneutics, but all you really need to know is what the Bible says. You've got to rightly divide the word that God has given to us. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So, there are four hermeneutical approaches to the book of the Revelation. 
Um, the first is what's called preterism. Uh, Presbyterians hold this, the Catholics certainly hold it, and many of Reformed theologians hold it, because after all, they came out of the Catholic Church uh, in uh, protest. They were protesters or Protestants. And uh, the true Church of Christ was never part of that. The real believers, and it's hard to find this because after all, they were a persecuted people. Um, they were on the outskirts, little groups of believers that would gather just like we're doing here tonight and believe the Word of God and held it. God never needs a lot, by the way. Sometimes a very small remnant, but a remnant nonetheless. At any rate, the preterist believes that the Olivet Discourse will be getting to this, oh, what is it now? We're in chapter 17. We've got a long way to go. But we'll get to chapter 24 and 25. That is called the Olivet Discourse. There are three major discourses, Sermon on the Mount, and the Olivet Discourse, and then the Upper Room Discourse. But the Olivet Discourse uh, uh, was precipitated by the apostles asking the question, uh, what shall be the uh, sign of the end of the world and the sign of your coming? In Matthew 24, 3. And Jesus then answers them and gives them signs. These signs have nothing to do with the church. They have to do with the tribulation period. Uh, so again, proper hermeneutics, very important if we're going to even understand anything about eschatology. If we're going to understand end times, you've got to have a proper view of this. At any rate, the preterist believes that everything happened in 70 AD. That uh, we've, got the, uh, we've got Titus coming in, uh, burning the temple, sacrificing Jews on the altar, and uh, ravaging the vestige of Jews that were able to escape to Masada. Uh, and you know the story, I hope. And the, uh, uh, he, he sieged Masada. It was way up on a hill, very difficult. So he just decided to siege it, starve them to death. It took two years. But uh, finally, at the end of the two years, Titus said, we've had enough here. We're going to go up. We're going to march up here. All the, what could be left in there? And once they got up and they opened the doors, they found out what was left. The Jews had killed themselves. Uh, so that was suicide. They committed suicide because rather than fall to the hands of the Gentiles. They said, uh, the preterist says that all that happened then and that that is the second coming. Events fulfilled by 70 AD with Nero as the Antichrist and the destruction of Jerusalem as the end of the world. So that's their perspective. Now there's some merit to all this, by the way. And um, then there's the historical perspective. Uh, hermeneutics uh, here teaching that the events are being ful uh, fulfilled through the continuing church age. Then there's the allegorical perspective. Uh, this meaning that events are to be understood figuratively and not historically. And then there's the futuristic perspective. And that means that events are yet to be fulfilled in a coming age. So you say, well, what's our position here, Pastor? I'd say, yes, all of these. Take them all. Enjoy. I sound like a politician, right? I don't want to offend anybody. You say, well, how could they all be true? Well, because what you have established in the Bible very clearly, if you understand the Old Testament especially, is you have paradigms. There are paradigms. There are, t there are types. There are foreshadowings. There are archetypical pictures all of which are pointing to a greater fulfillment. You have an immediate fulfillment, but something's going to come much later, which will be the ultimate fulfillment. So we might refer to this as dual fulfillment, though sometimes it's more than dual fulfillment. We can name a number of antichrists, can't we? Certainly Nebuchadnezzar would have been seen as an antichrist. If not he, what well, we'd have to say for sure, Antiochus Epiphanes under the Greek rule. And under the Roman rule, the Caesars, and Nero in particular, yes. All of these were foreshadowing something that would come at a much greater extent yet to come. So I'd have to say that I'm futuristic in my perspective. Things are yet to be fulfilled. I don't know how a preterist answers. And we have various levels of this uh, preterism, by the way. They're, they're, some of them believe, like R.C. Sproul, that it all happened in 70 A.D., uh, the Bible answer man uh, believes all, all of it happened in 70 AD except the coming of the Lord. Uh, uh, well, good for him. 
If you're going to be the Bible answer man, you got that figured out at least. Who would take a title like that? But uh, I mean, you got to really, you got to have a lot of love for yourself. I'm the Bible answer man. <laughs> I'd say the Bible has the answer, man. But uh, at any rate. So his perspective is, yeah, we're st everything was done except the coming of Jesus. That, that's the last thing. Well, of course. How can you say he came? How did he come? Well, he came invisibly. He came spiritually. They have a verse to back it up, you know. The kingdom of God cometh not with outward observation. Okay. What did he mean by that? Well, that's how they explain. He came, but you didn't see him. And so we're living in the golden age. Is that, that what you're telling me? That this is the millennium. We're living in the kingdom. Like I said, I'm so disappointed. I thought there'd be something better than this, right? <laughs> Futurism. But you say, what about this allegorical perspective? Origin, that fourth century heretic, though he's been canonized by the Catholic Church, he held the, that the Bible is allegorical. You're not to believe any of it literally. You don't take it literally. You know, today, it's uh, the young people in particular have taken up to using the word literal. Everything to them is, oh, literally. It, it, literally. I'm telling you, literally, they say. You know, literally? Yeah, literally. <laughs> so, well, I take the Bible literally. But you can't take it all literally. There are elements that demand interpretation, the book of Revelation in particular. But I'm glad to tell you that God doesn't leave us out here on a limb somewhere. If he gives us symbolism, then he gives us somewhere the description of what this symbol is, what it means. Now next week in my studies in Sunday school for Isaiah 66, I'll be taking some of this up. In particular, there's this the wonderful verse that speaks about uh, Israel and that Israel is going to uh, give birth in a day, going to be giving birth in a day. And uh, you see, that, that's... Uh, that's a wonderful thing, but it was requoted by John on the, on the Isle of Patmos. And Revelation chapter 12 has this imagery of a woman with 12 stars around her head. And uh, she's giving birth to a man-child. Well, you know, Catholics say that's the Virgin Mary. No, 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 no. It's Israel, the nation Israel. How do you know? Isaiah 66, at any rate. Allegory. There's allegory, there's interpretation. We have to understand the Bible speaks metaphorically and uses figures of speech, just as I do and just as you do. And people take umbrage with this and say, well, you've got to take it literally. Well, you can't take everything in it literally. When Jesus said, pluck out your eye if it offends you, well, then all of us would be blind here. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to understand that Jesus is speaking hyperbolically. He's not speaking. He's speaking with exaggerative tone. We have to understand that. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of trouble. I mean, if I said, you know, tomorrow it's going to rain cats and dogs, what are you going to do? Are you going to go out and say, say well, I'd like to have a dog? No, listen, it's just a figure of speech, right? Then I hear people say, it's hot as hell. I say, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> allegorical. There are portions of Revelation that are definitely allegorical. And so you're not going to understand who the woman is in chapter 17 without interpretation, proper hermeneutics. Um, okay. You know, I want to kind of take this up, I guess, in some detail. I, I don't want to do this Sunday morning, do I? Do you think I should do this? <laughs> I mean, I could lose half the audience. I've already lost half of them. So what, what am I going to do? They need to know this and to understand these things, right? So there they believed uh, the famine in 41, 54, that this was the famine that you find in Revelation chapter 6, you know, and the horse that comes out and has a scale in his hand, you know, and it's, uh, it's a time of great famine, right? So they said that happened in 41 through 54, and that that's the answer. It happened in the first century. There were a lot of famines after that, though, too. Didn't you know that? Paradigm. You'll find the paradigm in every age. They say, well, Nero was the Antichrist. He was an Antichrist. John said, there are already many Antichrists. I think he was referring to Domitian. When he wrote that, uh, Nero was gone already. But he said, there are already many Antichrists. Nero was certainly one of them. Claudius was another. And certainly Domitian. 
and you might say the ten kings that came after Nero, all the way up to uh, the the worst of all, uh, when we had the uh, the purging and the uh, extermination of Christians that happened. Um, all right, so running out of time. There's Hank. There's the Bible answer man. Goodbye. And there's R.C. Sproul, right? It all happened here. It happened during this time and so forth. So um, here's what they believe, or here's why they believe what they believe. And I say these salient points, Luke 9, 27. So he says, if I, t I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death. It's our text. He said, look, there, that proves it right there, that they would see the kingdom of God. Yeah, you see, that's why that chapter division is too confusing to me. It shouldn't be there. Why? Because what Jesus was referring to was about to happen. The transfiguration. Peter, James, and John would see Jesus in his glory. They saw him coming. Moses and Elijah with him. Which is going to happen in the book of the Revelation. So, you know, the two prophets in Revelation 11, who are they? They've got to be Moses and Elijah and Jesus comes then after they are the harbingers. So, um, but they point to this and say, that, there's your answer right there. It says it all. Uh, and they really lean on that verse. They lean, lean on this as, as well, Matthew 24, 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And they say, the accusative, this generation, this generation. So now we have an argument over a word, and that word is genia. And what does it mean? And uh, their argument is it means these people uh, here and now. Uh, it could mean that, but it also means this kind of people. The Jewish people, they will always exist, no matter who tries to exterminate them. <coughs> Hitler tried, came pretty close, because at the same time Stalin was murdering more Jews in Russia. Uh, but they couldn't do it. Pharaoh's tried to do it. He couldn't do it. Um, and so they've been really a persecuted lot of people. And they are such a minor proportion of the world's population. Point uh, oh three percent I think is, is, is how they have it figured. Very small number. But there they are. Why? Because Jesus said this generation will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. And so uh, try as they may, and the uh, Muslims are trying to get rid of them, you know, uh, come in there with their raiding parties and kill whatever they did, the way they did it, and so forth. Won't work. Not going to work. Uh, America eventually is going to pull the purse strings on this. All these things will have to be fulfilled. Oh, yes. And haven't, has not been fulfilled. So, that upon you may come all the righteous blood he shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel into the blood of Zacharias of uh, Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So here again, this generation. And he's pointing to that. Revelation 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And then, of course, the last verses of the Bible. Behold, I come quickly. And these, this, this is the foundation of their hermeneutical position of preterism. Um, so, we'll see. I guess I've got to do something on Sunday morning with this. People will be throwing rotten tomatoes at me. I'll have to find how I can make it interesting. That's why I put like a little humor in it. You know what I mean? It's a trick. I'm telling you. It's a trick to keep your attention. So, Lord, help us to keep our attention. Uh, we shouldn't need any tricks, but yes, Lord, it's hard today. We're not used to listening, sitting and listening. But we need to absorb this and understand that there's, uh, there's so much false doctrine afoot. And Lord, we don't want to be caught up into it. We want to rightly divide the word of truth. Help us to do it. And you said you'd send your spirit. And the spirit would guide us into all truth. And we do pray, Lord, that we would depend upon that. We're not here to exalt ourselves. We must learn from your spirit, from your word. 
All we are are students in the classroom of Christ. We've got lots to learn, Lord. Help us to do it. And Lord, to be sound in doctrine until the day you call us into your glory. Thank you for eternal life, Lord. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for the covering of our sins. Thank you for taking that judgment seat and making it a mercy seat for us. Thank you for the shed blood and the once for all sacrifice of your son. Thank you for the glory cloud of the Holy Spirit that descends upon the heart of the true believer who promised to abide with us and never leave us and never forsake us. We saw a glimpse of hell again tonight, Lord. A believer must always be reminded of what he has been saved from, plucked like a brand from the burning. And it makes us forever grateful people here, Lord, of what we could have been, what could have happened to us had it not been for your swift salvation. Uh, now, Lord, we have another week, and in this week we will have opportunities. We will be in places, Lord, where we will meet people that we've never met before, and we'll have the opportunity to have some impact upon their life. We hope, Lord, that it can be impactful and that we can bring light to very dark hearts. Help us to liberate, Lord. Give us the power. In Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. And you can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation.